Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session of the CBS Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Stephanie Lin. I am a member of the class of 2021 at Columbia Business School and the VP of Finance for the Social Enterprise Club. It is my pleasure to officially welcome my fellow students, faculty members, staff, and esteemed panelists this evening. A little background, the CBS Leadership Speaker Series was established to offer students access to those at the very center of business, giving us an opportunity to learn from CEOs, founders, and distinguished business leaders. Tonight, we will hear from Dean McLaurice, Professor Bruce Usher, and board member Mark Gallagly, co-founder and managing principal of Centerbridge Partners. After an introduction of our panelists by Dean McLaurus, Professor Usher will lead Mr. Gallagly in conversation about his professional experience in finance, work to combat climate change, and insights and lessons for current students. Guests will then have a chance to participate in a live Q&A session. Please submit questions via the Q&A button at any point during the conversation. You may also use the raise hand feature during the Q&A, and we will allow you to activate your video and microphone to ask your question face-to-face. -face. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Costas McLaurice, the 16th Dean, and David and Lynn Sofen, Professor of Business at Columbia Business School. Thank you very much for welcoming us this evening and for all your work that you do in the Social Enterprise Club. Uh, it's, it's great to be welcoming you once again uh, in our evening leadership speaker series. Uh, this is something that we started in the summer uh, and uh, is bringing together uh, amazing uh, leaders uh, to talk about uh, both their experience and share their insights uh, with all of us. And we're particularly grateful tonight to have uh, Mark Gologli uh, joining us. And uh, as uh, Stephanie said, it will be moderated in this conversation uh, by our good colleague and friend, Bruce Usher. What I'm gonna do is just offer an extremely brief introduction of Mark and Bruce and let them uh, take it on for what I'm sure is gonna be a very interesting discussion. So Mark graduated from our school in from Columbia Business School in 1986. Uh, he currently serves as co-founder and managing principal of Sanderbridge Partners. Uh, and he that is a leading uh, private investment firm, private equity firm that works in uh, leverage buyouts and distressed securities. He co-founded that firm uh, in 2005. Prior to Centerbridge, uh, Mark was with Blackstone for 16 years where he served as senior managing director and their head of the private equity uh, business and was a member of the firm's management and investment committees. Mark has a 30 year career in investing and in finance and is, uh, extremely accomplished uh, and he's also had tremendous impact also in policy and throughout his time uh, uh, this period he served in President Obama's Council of Jobs and Competitiveness and the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and here closer at home we are truly fortunate to have Mark's leadership and expertise uh, both at the school and at the university. He's a member of our uh, of our school's board and he's really a trusted advisor and friend. He's also the vice chair of the board of trustees of Columbia University. In both places, Mark really lends his insight and strategic vision and I know for one benefit from it uh, frequently uh, on very diverse issues. Now Mark, I mentioned earlier, he's the managing principal of Senderbridge, um, but only for two more weeks from what we just learned. Uh, so he announced his retirement and he's launching into a new journey that will focus on amplifying the positive social impact of his work through his philanthropy, impact investing and policy advocacy. Uh, he works primarily on climate change, among other things, as well as education and mental health. I'm sure this journey will touch many, many people and uh, society and the world will be a better place for all the work that you're gonna do, Mark. So thank you for joining us today. Now joining Mark uh, to moderate tonight's conversation is Bruce Usher. Bruce is a professor of professional practice at the school and he's the Elizabeth Strickler 80, uh, and Mark Gologli faculty director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. Bruce teaches course on the intersection of finance, social and environmental issues, 
and he is the recipient of the Singvi Prize for Scholarship in the Classroom, the Lear Award, and the Dean's Award of Teaching Excellence. Now, we have a few professors at the school uh, that we have to sort of slow them down from winning, winning teaching awards, and 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 Mark is uh, Bruce is one of them. Uh, otherwise, he will be winning the teaching award essentially every year, uh, as you can tell. Prior to his work at Columbia, uh, Bruce was a CEO of Eco Securities, uh, which developed greenhouse gas emission reduction projects in developing countries, and was later acquired by J.P. Morgan in 2009. And Previously, he, co he was co-founder and CEO of Treasury Connect, uh, which is an electronic trading solution uh, platform and solutions for banks. And prior to that, he worked in financial services uh, in New York and Tokyo. Bruce is an active investor. He uh, works, he's passionate about also and uh, things that have to do with the environment and climate change and clean energy. And he's a trusted friend and collaborator in these initiatives uh, here at the school. So I'll stop at that. Uh, and I'm truly excited uh, to hear the discussion uh, between you two. So thank you both of us for joining us. Kosti's so generous. Kosti's, thank you very much. Very, very kind introduction. Um, Mark, thank you for joining us this evening. It's really wonderful. Great to be here, Bruce. Thank you. I would start uh, by looking at your truly extraordinary career since graduating from Columbia Business School. And I thought we'd start the conversation by me asking you, what led you to found Centerbridge Partners? Maybe we could just start at that point in your career. Well, I had been investing for a long time before I started Centerbridge. Uh, I wanted to have an opportunity to start a business where I could be more directly involved in setting the culture of the of the institution. And I was fortunate enough to meet a fellow named Jeff Aronson, who started working together around 2000 and really hit it off. Uh, I was, I was uh, leading private equity business at my old firm, and Jeff was at another firm called Angelo Gordon. His expertise was in the credit markets and mine in private equity, and we ended up working together and investing during a downturn that took place around 2001. We had, I invested about a half a billion dollars and he did the same. That worked out really well. We got to know each other. Uh, we made good investments. We thought similarly, but he had a skill set that I didn't have, which was very focused on the liability side of a balance sheet. And mine was focused on the asset side of a balance sheet, what you do with a business when you buy it, what is truly worth and why and what you can do to improve and grow the business. Uh, so we, we took those two skills and brought them together to form Centerbridge. And, uh, and that was a good decision that, that worked out really well. It certainly has worked out very well indeed. You use the word culture. What's, what's changed in private equity in those 20 years since you've been together with Jeff? How have you seen the industry change and whether it's cultural or other, other changes you've seen in the sector? Well, you know, I started lending into the private equity what was then called the leverage buyout business, right after I left Columbia in 86. So I did that for a number of years and then I joined uh, Blackstone in 1989. So I've been involved in the business for you know, a long time and it, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. In general, the business is just greater. Uh, it, it's not necessarily better, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's greater, it's bigger, it does bigger deals uh, than it used to do. It has way more competition. Uh, there's a far greater degree of scrutiny on the business from LPs and from, uh, and from governments. The business touches more American lives uh, and therefore has more responsibility uh, placed on it. Uh, and the business, when all those things happen, you become, I think, if you do it well, uh, more knowledgeable and specialized in what you do. And you have a greater set of tools that you can bring to a business to help improve the business from IT tools to recruiting, to thinking about procurement, to trying to think through strategy in a deeper way. And I think the industry has matured over those 30 years. Mm, a lot of change there. Let's move the conversation to the present. And when I say the present, I'm thinking more specifically December 18th, because my understanding is that's when uh, you've announced you're uh, you're retiring from Centerbridge. 
uh, when you found it. And that's a very bold and unusual decision. And I put down the context, the fact that most founders of PE firms either uh, retire much later in life or, or just never retire. And I'm thinking about, you know, Henry Kravis, another terrific uh, alumnus of, of the business school, or Steven Schwartzman over at, over at Blackstone. They haven't retired. Um, how did you make that decision, Mark? What led you to that? Well, I think, you know, Henry and, and Steve are sort of legendary figures in this business. Uh, but many, many people who found alternative asset firms do stay with it for their, for their full career. And I think that can be the right thing for them. For, for me, and Jeff and I have talked about this over a long period of time, because you need to prepare the firm by bringing in the right people to inherit responsibility within the business in order to make it an institution. And you need to prepare your limited partners so that they're comfortable with handing things off. There's not a great, there's not a complete track record, although some firms have done this, there's not a complete track record of being able to hand these kind of investing businesses from one group of founders or an individual founder to others. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about that. For me personally, I, I like the idea of having multiple chapters in a life. And uh, I've been able, I've been lucky to do that. And I want to have, uh, this is from a personal point of view, a new chapter. From a firm perspective, and, and Ray Horton, you know, who was my favorite professor when I was at school, uh, Ray would always say, understand your relationship between what you're doing, your, your obligations, what your role is, and the institution that you work for, or in this case, the institution that I was uh, lucky enough to co-found. And for, for me, I think the firm is better off for, with me passing the baton because I've been doing it for 15 years. I've run the business for 15 years with Jeff. And I think that's a hell of a long time. So, you know, there are other people who are totally focused, totally engaged, hugely capable, who I've trained in some cases, uh, they've been with me for 25 years. And so, you know, they're fully capable of taking this business to the next level. And at the same time, giving me the opportunity to go do some new and interesting things and try to stretch myself. But do you think you're at the vanguard of this sort of shift, a generational shift, given that you started in the 80s? That's when PE really started to come into its own. And if you I don't know about the vanguard, but yes, there are a number of firms who are going through or will be going through these kind of shifts. Some of the oldest firms in the industry, you know, Warburg Pincus or Clayton Duvalier, those firms or Hellman Friedman those firms have already taken that shift. And we are, we are one of the larger new firms, uh, newer firms. And so, uh, and so we're going through that. And you know, different firms are in different journeys around that. Hedge funds historically have been you know, not good at tr tr generational transition. Private equity firms have been better at it uh, for a variety of reasons that we could talk about. Tell me, tell me a little bit more. What, what, why is it you think the... Well, I think the hedge fund business is, a, is, first of all, hedge fund as an industry is under pressure in terms of returns. And historically, hedge funds about, have been about an investor making a business decision to buy a security or short a security. Uh, I'm speaking you know, pretty broadly now. And some firms have built out multiple platforms, either of businesses or of teams, and successfully had transition. But many have not. Many have not. Private equity is more of a team sport where you have a group of people, particularly in today's world, who divide the economy down into some sectors that they understand ostensibly better than their correct competitors do. And whether it's in healthcare or in TMT or in tech investing, they have an angle as to what they're going to do. And that allows you to have some stability within that industry vertical and then operate above that in a way that's making decisions, final decisions on investments. And I think that tends to convey the opportunity for generational transition in a differentiated way. And you, you used the word just a few minutes ago, chapters. You said you, you, you think about your life sort of in, in, in chapters and uh, I think it's a nice way of framing it. When you think about the next chapter, um, right. What considerations come into play there? How, how, to tell us, go, go a little deeper on that. Uh, that well, part. you know, I'm just finishing what I'm doing now. And so I, I reserve the right to change my mind on this <laughs> totally. Uh, but, you know, for right now, what, what, uh, what I am focused on is developing a business called Three Karens, 
which started out as a family office when uh, Lisa and I, my wife and I, who's also a CBS grad, started the business about six years ago. And we were focused very much on climate. So we've made about a dozen venture investments around climate within Three Karens. And having developed that and seen it, I think what we have identified as an opportunity to be a firm where we're not looking for outside capital. Not, I'm not looking in any way to ever uh, raise money or manage money for others. I'll, I'll remain a shareholder you know, forever in Centerbridge, and I, I want that firm to thrive and to grow. But instead, with our own capital, I will focus on investing behind climate, mostly venture-focused investing. And then we have a couple of initiatives outside of that around public policy, politics, and philanthropy. So those four things, investing plus those three. And as, as Kostis mentioned at the beginning of this, we have a, a deep interest in, in education and in mental health issues as well. So we'll spend time on that. There are so many things that people can focus on and do. Uh, you know, you don't want to uh, put yourself in a position where you can't evolve what you're doing, but the, the primary focus of Three Karens is going to be on the issues I've just mentioned. Yeah, that makes sense. So you use the word investing describing what Three Karens will be doing, but of course, Sandra Bridge is also an investor, to use that term yes. broadly. What is it you can or hope to do in, in Three Karens that you couldn't or wouldn't do? And I realized, obviously, Sandra Bridge is outside funds. You have LPs. It's an extremely large set of funds, very different story. Right. T- right. Talk through that a little bit. What I, I want to focus more on and issue climate and the intersection of climate and technology. So, you know, Centerbridge is a private equity firm that does, you know, many types of things, but we're not focused on on what I would characterize as venture. Uh, and, And that's an area that I'm interested in because I think that that's an area that needs a lot of focus in order to address some of the core issues that we have. So that'll be the major difference between the type of investing that I'm doing uh, at Three Karens and the type of investing that Centerbridge does. And the key thing is I'm not doing this with other people's money. I'm doing it with, with, uh, you know, with my capital or in partnership with other people, but not looking to manage capital, not looking to be in competition with, with uh, the firm I started. Right. And would you, would you apply the term impact investing to what you'd be doing at Three Karens? When I say impact investing, which is a term that- I would, I would, yeah. I would, I would suggest yes. And, and, and the definition we, at least we've been using in, in, in my teaching of impact investing is investing with the intention of addressing a social or environmental issue. Um, so it sounds like you do have a very clear intention here. You've got certain issues uh, climate change and others that you have some objective to to improve upon. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, you know, and, and then there's a debate around impact investing as to what are the returns that you should get from impact investing. And that whole, you know, cacophony yeah. of uh, really good yeah. questions. Yeah, what are, you, and, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think for for me at Three Carrots, I'm not as because one of the benefits of this. Uh, you know, being in a position where you're investing your own capital is, you can set your own risk tolerance. And my risk tolerance is higher in, you know, obviously higher in earlier stage things than it would be in a a more traditional leverageable private equity business that you're looking for steady and stable returns on. And the core thing that I'm looking for are opportunities to have a, a sizable impact, you know, because if we're, admitting what we're admitting in terms of uh, CO2 today, uh, you have to think about what sort of scale can you be involved in or can have an opportunity to break through. And that's that's a real interest to me. Yeah. So actually, that's a good segue to point. So I want to talk about climate change for a minute or two. But you intentionally focus on climate and a couple other issues uh, through Three Cairns. And yet, yes. you know, our country is faced with a lot of, a lot of challenges the minute our our, our world is faced with a lot of challenges. Why did you pick climate and the, and the other issues you picked? Why, why those? Well, you know, this, this, is a, this is the right question. You know, why that? And as I said at the beginning, I, I reserve the right to change it. But I, <laughs> I guess the way I think about it is, you know, in private equity, we're always trying to figure out, and, and in anything that you're doing, you're trying to figure out what is the big thing? Mm-hmm. You know, what is the big major issue that you face? So 
you know, I, I was on a board with a great friend for years who was the former CEO of Harley Davidson. And we, we became good buddies and used to travel to go see CEOs on occasion. And his, his question was always, uh, Keith Wandell, his name is, Keith would always say, tell me your problem. And then he would be silent. And sometimes the CEO he was facing would tell them, tell him, tell us the problem. And sometimes not, you know, and Keith would go back and repeat the question. And I think that if we look at the problems today, there, there are obviously a huge number of opportunities, you know, to be young and coming out of Columbia with, with uh, a, a spark and an opportunity to go change things or improve things or just get a job that you and a career that you're really proud of and you really like. That is a fantastic thing. I'm flipping it around now and talking about a problem. That doesn't mean there aren't opportunities, okay? I, I look at it and say, this is the biggest problem. Climate's the biggest problem. And why, why is that? Because other things get solved. Or if they don't, they don't destroy the planet. And this one is uniquely, other than nuclear, capable of doing that. And that's, a, that's why I want to focus on that. Doesn't mean that there aren't other, so many issues democracy, race, inequality, uh, you know, mental health, healthcare being provided, fairness in our society. All of these things are, and I, you know, you could go down the list quite a bit further, right? Uh, uh, but for us, this is one that uh, we thought is the right thing to focus on for the reason I tried to say. Makes, makes good sense. You talked about the opportunity that our, our students our students have whether they go into any sector of the economy. And uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think there's just incredible number of things they can do. And some of our students, of course, will go into more traditional jobs and firms and others yeah. will go into, um, you know, perhaps impact investing as you describe it or social enterprise or even the nonprofit sector. Your career took you through the business sector. You went into business First Blackstone, and then you start your own business, and you're very successful in your career as an investor. How does that skill set then translate to the work you're doing at Three Carrots? Obviously, on the investing side, that translates. But how else does the skill set you've acquired, let's say, starting at Columbia Business School and over several decades, how does that allow you to have greater impact? And and um, really, uh, how does that career path? Yeah, I mean, I think your point's well taken. There's no one path, you know. You, you before we get on the Zoom, you talked about Japan, and there was the you know the old uh, uh, Zen statement that all roads lead to the top of Mount Fuji, you know. And I think that there's lots of ways to get where you want to go, uh, and there does not have to be any one path. For for me, uh, I have a I have a particular interest in public policy and politics, and how the intersection of business, big business, financial business, technology businesses, more traditional businesses fit into society and what responsibility business has at the intersection of policy and politics. And so that, that I think drives some of the reasons why I wanna do what we're talking about doing tonight, you know, because I think those things fit together and the major changes that we need often require them to fit together and operate better than they have been. Yeah, yeah. So when you were at Columbia Business School, the idea of those things combining was, you know, barely discussed. In fact, probably the only person who did was was Ray Horton, Professor Horton. You mentioned was your favorite. Maybe teacher. that's why he was my favorite. I don't know. <laughs> well, he's certainly he's certainly my favorite. He'd be my mentor, if not my my didn't have the opportunity to take him as a, as a, as a professor. Um, but that has changed a great deal. Right, There's these these ideas that business um, has a really important role in society, um, and not just in the form of employment and economic growth, but actually, you know, responsibility beyond that. Um, so I want to sort of get your thoughts on that because there's a little, been a lot of talk these days, and businesses make announcements on, on what they're going to do for society. You have the business roundtable coming out with these statements signed by many of many of the country's leading CEOs. Um, how, do you, how do you see that going forward? How do you envision business leading on these social issues, these environmental issues like climate change? And um, what are the challenges that they're also gonna face as, as they attempt to, 
take that responsibility on. Well, first, first, let's step back a little bit. Businesses' involvement in public society has been something that's always there. It sometimes goes up and sometimes goes down, but it's a presence. Take, for example, uh, in the recent decision-making post uh, the presidential election, you saw you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce come out and say, along with the National Manufacturers Association and ultimately the Business Roundtable and ultimately about 100 CEOs here in New York, uh, or basically in New York, come out and say, hey, we have a president-elect, for example. This was perceived at the time as being front page news, okay? It was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was not really front page news, but it was worthy of front page news because business was taking a stand on something. And I think we've now become more, business people have become a little more attuned to being willing to stay, say what they think about a situation. I don't want to overstate that because, you know, you don't, you recognize that if a CEO of a business, let's say one of your students is going to become, she or he is going to become the CEO of a business. Now you're going down to meet with a, someone who's in government. What is your problem? I just said, what's the problem? What is your problem? Well, your problem may be, uh, you know, uh, insurance rates or healthcare rates or the minimum wage, or it may be uh, taxation or other financial regulation, if you're a bank, for example. All of these things become problems. And if you're, if you're not willing to make the thing, whatever the thing is, in my case, I've already described what it is, the problem, then you're not going to have much impact. Because the, the thing that you are focused on isn't actually the isn't actually what society's big issue is, which is why you need well-regulated markets and government. That's why you need to have a force independent of capital or independent of business. And I, I'm pitching the idea that they can work together, but I do not think that business in any way alone can solve the kinds of issues that we face. They can be a leader, in some cases a pusher, uh, but they don't have the power that governments and sovereign states have. Even the most powerful companies aren't that powerful. And then you have tragedy comments and other issues that, that make it hard for them to do it. But they are changing. And if we, if we stick on the topic of business and climate change, for example, you're seeing rapid change among some companies, utilities incorporating solar and wind into the mix, oil and yeah. gas companies announcing, you know, transitioning towards net zero and so on. The automobile industry, you know, Tesla isn't just the most valuable company in the sector. It's more valuable than pretty much every other car company combined. Um, I'm not going to ask you whether or not that's the right, the right value on Tesla. But, but I, what, I, what I do wonder is, with these changes, do you think the incumbent companies are likely to remain dominant in their sectors? Or do you see a lot of upstarts overturning the status quo? And obviously, Tesla was an upstart, but in oil and gas and utilities and other transportation sectors, you've yet to see those changes. And in fact, some of the incumbents are doing pretty well. So I was wondering your thoughts. Yeah, nimble incumbents can do really well. Nimble incumbents can do really well. You said the utility business, you know, the largest market cap utility probably is Nextera. So that's a that's a nimble incumbent who has embraced, embraced uh, uh, renewables in a major way and embraced moving into markets that have higher growth where the historic monopolist provider has not been so nimble. Uh, and so you can follow their movement across the South uh, as a result of that. So that's an example of a nimble incumbent. But are there gonna be disruptors? Absolutely, thank God, that's the nature of capitalism in America. So that, that should be a good thing. Yeah, and you put on nimble incumbents, I think that's a great term. I mean, I was shocked to see uh, a couple of weeks ago, next year is market cap surpassing Exxon Mobil's to become right. the most valuable energy company now. In the right. last days, Exxon Mobil just moved ahead of it. Well, but the fellow who's running that business, Jim Robo, is a terrific senior executive, very creative, totally focused on climate and trying to think it through. Uh, has two kids who are just about your students' ages, uh, and both of whom are scientists, and both of whom are really focused on it as well. And so you get this very creative business leader listening to young people, uh, not just not just his children, and, and making change happen. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that the younger people that you're dealing with, and I use that phrase only because they're younger than I am, 
uh, you know, they, they can have an impact even in the businesses they join because their voice is new and fresh. And when combined with their colleagues, they can they can move things. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's make the with, with the incumbent companies they've got, it can make such a big difference there. Uh, a lot of new technologies are coming up to the market. So you mentioned you know the world of business, government regulation, these things coming together. So obviously we're about to get a change in government and potentially a change in regulations as well. What do you expect expectations for the Biden administration on climate change or more broadly? Um, what are your thoughts on, on how this country might- Well, I'm excited for the Biden administration on climate. I mean, first though, they recognize that climate change is a reality. This is a base, baseline of it. They've made a couple of decisions around people that I think are important to make. Uh, they put at the center of how they think about job creation, innovation, and growth, uh, uh, climate as a core issue to drive innovation and drive growth and ultimately job drive job creation. Um, I think they've chosen some really good people. Uh, and you know, if you think about John Kerry, for example, being an envoy, what does that mean? He's going outside of the United States. And I'm just reading the press on this. I'm not, you know, but he's going outside of the United States and meeting people he knows on an issue that he wants to talk about and then reaching some agreement with them or hearing from them that we're not doing enough for them to do X, right? So that's a natural feedback loop into American society. Uh, I don't know that this is announced, but it's been in the press that uh, a fellow like Brian Deese would become head of the it's, NEC. It's, the NEC is the- Yeah, I think, I, I think it was just announced. Again, I don't know if it's official, but it's, it's definitely- Good, good. I, I thought it would, you know, anyway. So Brian is responsible for climate and sustainability at BlackRock. And you know he has a good, excellent background in climate, but also in economics. And so having someone like that as the head of the NEC, the National Economic Council, which is the, which is the mirror of the National Security Council within the White House, that's a powerful position and a good person to run it if you wanna think about climate as a core issue around economic policy. So those are two examples, and there are many others of decision-making that I think is, uh, Excellent. Terrific. So we've talked about your past. We talked a lot about the present and and then and, and hopefully the transition where it, let's just um, just look at the time here. We've got about five minutes before we open up for, for questions. Let's talk about the future. So uh, where where could things be in four years on and, and business and climate? Um, what kind of changes would you like to see happen? Uh, I'd like to see Columbia University's climate school be a huge success, uh, <laughs> become something that is the galvanizing way that uh, climate is, is continues to be, because Columbia as an institution, both the business school, the work that you are doing and Jeffrey's doing and others, but overall throughout the institution is a leader. Columbia University has a thousand people currently working on climate change. If you look at the Earth Institute, Lamont Dory, and the engineering school and a number of the other, the energy center at CIPA, et cetera. Take everybody together, about a thousand people working on climate. So the institution across uh, all of its, all of its uh, manifestations is the leader and the climate school I'm hoping can be a real driving force in that over the next number of years. You, you talk broadly, I mean, I'd like to see us think carefully about what's next after Paris, how do we, how do we reach some agreement with the major emitters? We emit about 15% of CO2, 85% therefore is outside of the United States. Historically, we've been responsible for about 25% of what's up in our atmosphere. How do we think about reaching agreement with our obvious competitors and adversaries mm -hmm. to make real change? And, and then thirdly, I'd like the United States to massively increase its R&D spend because we're not able to, right now, for example, we're all gonna receive vaccines for free, right? That's the pitch. How come they're for free? Why are they going to be free? Because the US government has bought all the vaccines. We've reached forward agreements to buy all the vaccines. It's not that simple in climate because we've admit, we keep admitting 50 billion gigatons a year. So how are we going to be able to take that out of the atmosphere? We need to figure out a way to make that happen. And that's gonna require a lot of money 
where's it going to come from? Who's going to fund it? How much R&D are we going to spend? So that's what I'd like to see over the next few years. Yeah, and just as we discussed just before the before the call, um, this idea that what has been accomplished in vaccines to, to address COVID-19, that's an interesting thought for, for climate change. As you mentioned, climate change is far more complex. It's, a, it's the biggest problem we face as, a, as humanity right now. But the the idea of taking what is the best of government and the power that government has with business innovation and the nonprofit sector too. There are a number of nonprofits that really contributed to that and bring them together is, is really what can make a difference. I agree with you. I, we haven't spoken much about non-governmental organization or not-for-profits, mm -hmm. but ob obviously uh, many of those businesses and uh, institutions have been hugely important to where we are around climate. And I keep talking about government and business and not speaking about them. That's my, that's a mistake. I shouldn't have presented it quite that way. Well, we only have so much time here. So it's hard to get it all in. Speaking of which, um, I think we should open it up to uh, to questions. I believe we have some here. And Stephanie, I turn over to you to lead us on that. Go ahead. I see a raised hand from uh, <coughs> Shanta Kumar. Um, if you could please open your video and ask your question. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Stephanie. Mark, my question is, as Columbia students uh, coming out of the MBA program, what do you think are the most useful asset classes to look at focusing on in driving an impact as we go towards a low carbon future? And the context of that question is, um, before Columbia, I was working in institutional impact investment, and we were focusing on infrastructure and real assets in Asia because we saw that that was a key area in which to sort of shape the urban development trajectory in the region. Um, and then you talked about the sort of nimble incumbents who are working with some of the key Singapore government entities and their capabilities in trying to build out, you know, low carbon, large urban developments in the region. So I was curious on your thoughts on why the folks in venture capital versus PE or other asset classes and your guidance I think, to us. I think uh, this, is an excellent, this is an excellent question, okay? So, I happen to want to focus on VC. That doesn't mean that everybody should focus on VC. One of the reasons I want to focus on VC is because I'm interested in learning new things around technology, okay? And because my firm doesn't focus on it. <laughs> so I don't want to be in competition with what they're doing, okay? But if you, if, uh, you know, I was in Singapore, uh, this is pre-pandemic, uh, and the, obviously, and the prime minister had recently spoken about the, the challenge of climate for Singapore. Uh, and so, so he, he committed the country to spend $100 billion, a billion dollars a year for 100 years on figuring out climate. That was his pitch. And figuring it out, meaning protecting the island state, right, the nation state. And if you go to Singapore, you can see why. Uh, it, but you're also in New York City. You just have to walk down to the Hudson and you can see why. And there's no difference between the two. The water is right there. And so I think that infrastructure, core infrastructure is totally worthy of as an asset class. And just learning asset investing, if you're interested in finance, which you do not have to be to be involved in climate. Okay, there are lots of ways to be involved in it. Uh, but if you did, just learning how to invest allows you to think around what you might do in the future. So even if what you do right after you leave business school is not around this issue. It does not mean that you cannot have an impact on it, either as a leader in a business, a business that has nothing to do with investing or investing, or if you take one asset class that you happen to be interested in and then apply the skills and tools that you learn in that to another. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you for your support for the Three Cranes uh, Climate Fellowship. I was one of the batch this year. That's great. That's another conversation. I'd like to hear about it. So I'm getting some questions. Stephanie just froze. Nope. Hang on one second, Mark. I don't know if. Uh... By the way, I said 50. I meant to say 50 gigatons. I hope I did before we were talking about tons. I think everyone got the point. <laughs> uh, 50 billion tons or 50 gigatons. Uh, it's a key point. Uh, Stephanie, you're yes. back. 
Sorry about that. Um, so it seems like there are some questions regarding the future of impact investing, especially navigating COVID and also in general. Uh, I will admit uh, when I got brought back, some of the questions have disappeared. So I'm trying to <laughs> off of memory. So if you could please resend in your questions, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, you can't see the chat box. Um, all right, we'll just keep going. Stephanie, should we uh, go with that, that first question then? Yes, um, so the first question, or rather the first topic, I guess, is about the role of impact investing. So what is the role of impact investing in the financial system and how will it be impacted by COVID and the new presidential administration? Mark, do you want to get thought? I'm not sure how I'm not sure how impact investing is necessarily going to be impacted by COVID. I haven't thought much about that. I want to reflect on that for a minute. But you know, as an asset category, this is a relatively new asset category, relatively new. Okay, so it, you know, I I believe that as an investor or as an investment category, you have to live through cycles, which is maybe where they're getting to in COVID. Uh, in order to understand the longevity of that asset category, you have to go through cycles, ups and downs in order to understand what's the, what's the staying power of that asset category. And impact investing, it's not a perfect phrase, but it's trying to describe what Bruce already said earlier. And I think it will ultimately determine as to whether it grows as an asset category based upon what sort of returns it gives to its investors. And if it gives a, what I'll characterize as a quote, good return, then it will really grow. Mm -hmm. What is good? You know, if the 10 year is, you know, more or less 1% to zero, okay, then good is whatever you think the spread necessary to reflect the risk associated with that is. Right now, you know, real estate investing, opportunistic even real estate investing is probably giving you a 12 gross and gaining all the money in the, you know, that it, you know, growing hugely. So I feel like impact investing could grow quite a bit if it does in a zone, a good spread to the 10 year, because people are going to recognize this more and more, I believe, as a category that they want to be in for other societal reasons. But it won't work and it won't grow as much if it doesn't do a good job investing. I'll leave it there. All right. By the way, it's possible that COVID creates more focus on impact, which is where I think your, your uh, questioner may be going. But let's go to another question so I don't spend too much time on that. We have some questions about career paths. Um, people are asking, would you be able to share any lessons about mentorship, uh, finding and building these types of mentor-mentee relationships? And how do you think that process has changed given the state of what we are today? And also somebody is asking what it was like, uh, the pros and cons of the path of building a career at two firms versus someone who would move around more frequently. This is this last question I'll start with uh, and then come back to mentorship. The fellow who started, uh, co-founded uh, Blackstone I went to see him, um, you know, 1998 and told him I was leaving the firm to start my own business. Okay. Uh, and he said, uh, I'll make the long story short. Don't do that. That's a dumb idea. Okay. Why don't you stay? We'll have you run a fund. If you do really well, you can run all private equity. And then if you do really well, you can go start your own firm. And that's exactly what happened. I stayed for six more years. His pitch was the two people I was going to join the firm with both one of whom was a CFO of Microsoft at the time, one of whom was a big time CEO. I didn't know them that well, his pitch to me was. They didn't really, you didn't really bring a differentiated position and they wanted to live in Seattle and in Colorado. And what the hell, uh, that doesn't sound like a good start. So his pitch was, this was not the right time. He was speaking his book, he didn't want me to leave, but it turned out, I think he was right. His, if he went back and, and made a presentation at one of the other business schools um, at Harvard Business School a number of years ago saying, everybody who's ever left working for me left too early. 
okay? Not quite literally true, but that's more or less what he was saying. That, and I think that, that there's a different way to say that. Obviously, many people have started some of the most important businesses in the United States by leaving college early, okay? <laughs> so there is no one time to leave something. But what you do want to try to think about is what is your proposition? What are you doing that's different and differentiated? Who are you doing it with? This is the number one thing. Who are you doing it with? Who's your partner? Who are the people you're going to work with? Who have you learned from? All of that. It's all about the who. I, you know, I really believe that. It's about who you work with, who your friends are, who your spouse is. All about the who, okay? And... I think that that, and who your mentors are, to go back to the beginning question. And you have to spend a little time working that. How good a mentor are you to other people? You know, if you're not very good at it, you might want to think about that. If you're really good at it, then you know what you're doing well and what you're looking for in your mentor. So we have a question that's sort of tangential to that. Uh, somebody says, with the rise of impact investing and other opportunities for social impact, it seems like there's more room for business leaders to build a successful career in finance that's more on personal passions than anything else. And they want advice on whether this is possible or advisable even. And somebody else is asking a broader question about what they think impact investing's role should be in the financial system itself. Bruce, what do you think about these two questions? I'll leave it, push that over to you. <laughs> First of all, I think they're good questions. They're hard questions to answer. The, the, the response I give to this question, which I give in different forms, is I always recommend students become really good at whatever they do when they graduate. In other words, people think of impact investing as you have to immediately go and put capital work that's going to change the world. And some people will do that, and I hope Mark and three Karens do that as quickly as possible. But... If you're great in marketing, if you're great in HR, if you're great in technology, if you're great in anything over a number of years, you can then take that skill set and apply it to having impact in some form. So a, li a little bit reflecting what you just said, Mark, is you don't want to jump into this area too early because you won't be very effective necessarily. Um, some students do. Some students get into impact investing very right, right out of CBS and it works. But for many students, I think they have to, um, you know, build a skill set that they can really optimize over time. Yeah, I, I, I basically 100% uh, endorse that strategy. And you'd be surprised if you, for example, really understand an industry, the nomenclature of the industry, what the drivers are behind the industry, whether you're in finance or you're at the company then the applicability of that insight, that series of insights into other things is quite, you know, it's quite real and transferable. Doesn't mean that anybody can run, one general manager can run any type of business, but it does mean that how you think about business and how you think about improving business, doing more with less, doing more with less, I think is a, uh, is a skill set that you wanna make sure you learn before you decide I want to be an impact investor, okay? And uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. The last, well, Stephanie has another comment, uh, the question. Yeah, the last thing I would say is, I think to be a successful investor is, is very hard. And, and Mark, uh, Mark's the exception, not, not, not. not no, uh, I'd, say, I'd say it's really hard. And I've had funds that have been spectacular. I had a lousy fund a number of years ago that I really had to come back from. And one, one other thing about being, in business or in life is that you are gonna get up and you're gonna get knocked down, okay? It's not, it's not a straight line. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true, definitely true for me. And it's true, I think, for every person that I've met who's been around business. Yeah, so investing is very hard. Creating social and environmental change is really hard. And doing the two together, which is impact investing, it's not easier. <laughs> I think it's even harder. So it's it's something to keep in mind. Anyway, I don't want to get stuck in this one question. Stephanie, back to you. Uh, yes. So uh, we're going to pivot to the PE industry and the future of the PE industry. Somebody asks, so you talked about how PE has changed over the past few decades. And do you see the industry continuing to change 
in that it still has more specialization and better tools? And what do you think will be different? And I they do. Also I, I, go ahead, please, Stephanie. Oh, sorry. sorry. They also want to know what is your favorite deal that you've worked on? <laughs> Um, you know, I, I do see it continuing to evolve and change, yes. And specialization, I think, will be the, you'll see more and more of that. Uh, I think private equity well done is an excellent form of capitalism. You know, it's, it's an, it, you're close to the assets, you're really focused on it, you're focused on it for a period of years, not a period of, of uh, not a short window of time, but a period of years. Um, in core investing, you can be focused on it for 20 years. And you're really trying to figure out a way to take all of the resources of your firm and your people and grow the business and gain a reputation for being someone who's excellent to work with, excellent for the employees, for the owners, for the managers, for the CEOs, for the boards, and just allow yourself to keep doing that because people want to do business with you. You know, and ultimately, I think the the uh, it's very likely that the retail market gets tapped even further than it already has, and that is a massive source of funding. And therefore, I think this business continues to grow. Yes. Right. Favorite deal? I'm going to pass on that one for right now. I've got a lot of investments that I really like. Okay, so it seems like we have time for one more question or so. And this one is about business school in general. Someone asks, do you have thoughts on the future value of business school? I know you are on the CBS board. So I was wondering if you have any insight from this experience. Yeah, I think I think business school has a hugely important role to play. And we talked about the skills that you have and the chapter, I, I believe in chapters. I think that you have the ability when going into business school, in some cases, uh, to turn the page on a chapter. In other words, go into something that you might not have otherwise done, which I think is hugely important. Secondly, I think uh, the opportunity to learn skills that you might not be able to learn in a, cons in a concise way, in a form formalized way uh, that might take you know, just years to do. And then lastly, I think the relationships and the who that you create is is hugely powerful. So it's not for everybody, but I think it's got a real place in a well-run, uh, you know, exceptional school. If the school is, is not that, then I think it's going to struggle. All right. And I believe, Professor Usher, you have a question you have saved up for uh, Mr. Gallagly. <laughs> I, I do have one last question to, to, to wrap us up. And it's, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a question really about our, our current situation, Mark, which is, you know, we're obviously in the midst of a, of a crisis. It's an unusual crisis in a sense. We haven't had a pandemic for a century now, but um, it's a crisis nonetheless. And obviously you've had experience with past crises, economic crises or financial crises. You started your... Santa Bridge, right around uh, the big crisis of 2000, 2001. We, of course, had the, uh, the Great Recession and there have been other very challenging times. Um, what are the sort of lessons or experience you can share of having been in business through multiple crises over the years and, and how, uh, how students are sort of think about not so much the moment we're in right now, but the, you put it, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows that come with working in business over a long career? So I started Centerbridge with Jeff at the very end of 2005, and we raised a fund in 06. We spent very little of that fund for the next 18 months because the world was really riding high. And then when the crisis in 08 happened, we invested we had about three and a quarter billion dollars in our first fund. We, we went all in. Uh, I met Jeff uh, around the time of a business called WorldCom and Adelphia and some accounting crisis and Enron that took place in the early part of this century. Uh, so those two really important events uh, or important cycles were significant to what we were doing. The, the crisis that we're working through uh, right now, living through right now, is one that's affecting you as students in a way it's 
that's really profound, you know, for all the reasons I'm not going to repeat to you. Uh, I do think that um, all crises, at least in my limited view of it, economic crises, are remarkably memorable. <laughs> you know, you'll remember this moment. It may feel like, yeah, I'll remember it as being horrible because there's been a lot of horror within it. But there's also an opportunity, and not but, you know, let's accept that. That's a true fact, okay? That's just the way it is. Uh, and there's, a, there's an opportunity to think about crisis as a way, how, how are you as a person and how are we as a society dealing with it? What did it reveal about your own uh, dreams and aspirations? And what did it reveal about the nature of our society? And so each crisis has that opportunity and often there's a backlash to the crisis. That's a deeper question than I, than I have an answer for right now, but I am really hard thinking about what happens as a result of this crisis. You know, we can see in 08 that there's been a political backlash around the world, around populism and some other things that I think is tied directly to that, that economic uh, crisis around ultimately the origin of which was housing in the United States, but it, it created a whole flow of uh, repercussions and we're still living with some of those. What, what repercussions will there be from this one? I'm not sure, okay? Other than that, that I know that it won't be the, the last one you as a business person uh, face, you know, or as an American citizen uh, and, or a citizen of the world. And so I just urge you to just think about this in that context. As a business person, my last pitch on this would be, Friend of mine who runs a really major, major business, and he runs it really well, thinks about his life this way. He says, I wake up, I know people are going to be, bring me problems. Bring me problems, okay? That's what I do. Because my job is to think about problems and what I want to do about them. Mm -hmm. and, then, and if you have that as, I, I think he sleeps better at night than he might otherwise sleep because he knows that his life is about thinking about problems. He's not surprised when someone comes to him with a problem. He's expecting them to come with a problem mm -hmm. or to be able to identify that. And I, I think that's a worthy way as you come out of this crisis to think about things. It's a worthy way to, I know I'm going to be rejected by X numbers of firms. That's just what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to find someone who I want to work with and I think that's a stabilizing way in the face of a crisis to think about where you are. Yeah, it's a great way to put it, Mark. Thank you very much. Nice way to wrap up. Stephanie, thank you very much for leading us in the Q&A. Even though you had a little Zoom drop there, you rebounded nicely. And uh, Mark, as always. Stephanie, thank you. Wonderful to see you. Bruce, great to see you. I hope this was helpful or useful. It's fun for me. Thanks a lot, everybody. Same here. Take care. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.